received both a lot of academic attention but also popular attention so i think we're ready to go and i'd like to welcome uh, dr wolf and thank her for joining us very early in the morning in the uk good morning can you hear me yes. <laughs> and can you see my slides yes. okay okay that's very good um so um thank you very much for asking me to join this forum it's um a great pleasure to be speaking to you this morning um, I have my cup of tea with me, as it's a little early, as you say. So um, I'm going to be talking about driving under the influence of drugs and some of the work that we did um, as a background to the production of the report, and also to talk about a few things which I think you're particularly interested in. And I believe there are some, uh, there's time for questions at the end of, of my presentation. So I um, look forward to speaking to you then. So back in um, 2011, the UK government um, agreed to implement what was known as the North Report, which was um, a consultation and a large um, process that was undertaken to look at um, the general framework for road safety. So looking both at drinking and driving. And it, from there came a view that there should be legislation for a specified drug in the body to be um, uh, an offence when driving. So really the, the job of the um, technical panel, of which I was the chair, was to identify which drug should be included in that legislation and um, what the threshold, what the cutoff levels should be. Um, and I know that one of the areas of interest um, of this group is um, why we looked at um, risk rather than impairment. And um, one of the things to bear in mind is that there's already legislation in the UK for driving whilst impaired. Um, and this was actually not working very well because um, police officers were finding on the roadside that it was very difficult to judge impairment and to record it in a way that they could use um, effectively in um, courts. Um, and we looked at that as well. And, and um, in our terms of reference, we looked at whether we could use impairment going forward and decided that it was actually quite difficult to try and define impairment for all the different classes of drugs that were involved. So uh, we felt that we couldn't use um, the fit tests which were used to um, judge impairment for alcohol use because um, there was some evidence that for instance stimulant drugs um, or people that use them were able to do very well in a fit test which is walking in a straight line and standing on one leg and, and finger to nose etc um, and therefore if we couldn't define easily impairment for um, the different drugs and it, it would be difficult I think to put that into leg legislation and having looked at the literature we also found there was no universal agreement on how to measure impairment so um, that was really the background for moving forward and looking at the level of risk and, and by that we mean the risk of having a road traffic accident and either being seriously or fatally um, injured as a result of that um, traffic risk. So moving on, I, I know, as is everywhere, cannabis is a key concern for um, you. And um, certainly the approach that we took was to look and see which drugs were used in driving populations. And in the UK, as elsewhere, cannabis was the most popular common um, illicit drug. 
and also um, very common within a driving population. So we have an annual, um, what used to be the British Crime Survey, which is now the survey for England and Wales, which identifies, um, actually asks a question about drug driving. So um, we look very closely at cannabis. Um, the, there is a huge literature on cannabis and driving. Um, it was very clear from the start that much research has identified that there is a significant dose-related decrement in driving performance if you um, take cannabis. And this, you can find this evidence in experimental, simulated laboratory, forensic traffic data, etc. So um, that is a well-established um, fact within the scientific literature. And also that um, raised THC, the main um, metabolite of cannabis, blood concentrations are also significantly associated with crash risk. Um, so the higher your blood concentration, the bigger the dose, the worse your driving performance. And in fact, I, I know you're also interested in looking at um, whether levels were comparable to blood alcohol levels. Um, and with cannabis in particular, there, there is again a lot of information in that area. And um, meta-analysis have shown um, either by smoking or um, by taking the, the drug and by consuming cannabis, you have a mean concentration of something like 3.7, 3.8, and different meta-analyses have, strangely, I think, identified a very similar concentration of THC. And this has been identified to impairing individuals to a degree comparable to blood alcohol concentrations of 50 mg per 100 ml of blood. So for cannabis, the information in relation to our legislation in alcohol is available. Um, again, most of the literature looks at 50 mg per 100 ml of blood, and in the UK, we have a higher level. Um, so for us, it wasn't as helpful, but other European countries have used um, this indicator to um, reinforce the fact that cannabis should be in the legislation, essentially. Um, lots of information about cannabis use behaviour. We look specifically at um, different smoking behaviours, whether you were a recreational user, um, and you can see that concentrations are higher. At, there's obviously acute intoxication, whereas in your chronic daily user, and there was great interest in the government about how we would look at different users within this population, um, and you can see that if you're using it on a chronic basis, that steady state concentrations tend to be much lower. They range between one and six, for instance. Um, and part of the reason for looking at this was to see whether we should have, uh, we should reflect on different use. Um, and cannabis um, pharmacokinetics are quite complicated. Um, it, it's a reasonably long-acting drug, so actually the half-life for THC is about 24 hours, but it has two bits to its elimination. Because it's a very lipophilic, fatty drug, it tends to sit in tissues, um, so it leaves the blood quite quickly, but maintains a low level um, during the day and whilst people are using it on a regular basis. Um, we also looked at passive exposure, and again, passive exposure didn't identify um, very high levels of THC. So you can see um, high concentrations in acute smokers, lower but sustained concentrations in chronic users, um, falling to a low level after 24 hours if you smoke a single uh, cigarette, and passive exposure has a low level. So looking at cannabis risk, so um, again, this is based on odds ratios and um, it's the risk of having a road traffic accident compared to an individual who hasn't used the drug. So we look, you look at whether what the risk is in a normal dri driving population um, who's had an accident and see whether cannabis makes a difference or not. So again, lots of information here meta-analysis of over 120 different studies and what we found was that there is significant increased crash risk when THC in the blood was greater than five 
micrograms per liter. And, and this is whether the ingestion had occurred recently um, or were in chronic users or, or regardless of the origin of the drug. Um, and so we thought this an important um, feature to consider and there, there's more in and we wrote a paper um, around this time so there's more if those people are interested in a, a publication that we produced in 2013. Um, so significant crash risk above five micrograms per litre, um, well established fact in the literature um, and if you look at um, crash, crash risk drivers consuming cannabis are two to six times more likely to, to be at a risk of a crash than somebody who is driving under the same conditions but who isn't using THC. And there are um, crash risks or odds ratios for that at different concentrations of um, cannabis. And the crash risk for um, somebody with five micrograms per litre or above is about twice as, as likely um, as somebody who hasn't used the drug. Um, interesting um, to look at alcohol use and cannabis. Um, so that we have odds ratios for alcohol use as well. And you can combine both of the odd risks for cannabis and for alcohol. Um, and there was a large study in France by Le Mans that looked at um, several, um, so 20, 30,000 people over a, ser over a period of time. And um, these are the odd ratios for cannabis use, for alcohol use, and um, for THC and alcohol combined. And you can see the traffic risk goes up significantly. So it's about 16 times um, the risk if you combine alcohol and THC um, compared to somebody who hasn't taken those substances. So I, I think alcohol use and cannabis is a, a dangerous combination. A little um, comment on medicinal cannabinoids. So um, again, we looked at that to see whether people that were legitimately taking this medication um, would fall foul, if you like, of um, any legislation. And um, the, the literature, again, quite clearly identifies that if somebody's taking their medication in accordance with um, the prescription, then they have low levels, about one to two micrograms per litre. And in fact, there is a medical defence. So if you were stopped at the roadside um, and you were positive in a road screen test for cannabis, you would be able to invoke the medical defence um, if you were able to produce evidence that you were um, legitimately prescribed the drug. Um, moving on to amphetamine. So um, we looked again at amphetamine um, in the same way. We don't see methamphetamine too often in the UK. It's much more common um, to see amphetamine, but I, I thought I'd just point out that um, methamphetamine breaks down in the body to amphetamine. So at the roadside, certainly, um, you would, would pick up um, methamphetamine and its metabolite. We considered um, the use of methamphetamine amphetamine as a prescribed drug and in fact there was a second consultation in the UK because um, they a, wanted to see the extent of amphetamine that was prescribed for ADHD for instance but also, also to judge whether the population felt that amphetamine should be identified as a medicinal compound or an illicit compound and actually um, the government went in the end um, for amphetamine as a medicinal compound. Uh, we looked at amphetamine um, with regard to um, its effect on sleep. So once you've had a binge, um, you come down, you're very tired. Um, and we looked at the effect of amphetamine as a stimulant drug, which actually enables performance to increase. So um, the downside for amphetamine is um, risk-taking, especially in the driving situation, um, lane changing, braking lights, driving recklessly, etc. Um, but also amphetamine in very low doses um, can be found to increase um, concentration and performance. We looked at um, sleep de deprivation literature, um, and Druid, which is a very big um, European study looking at um, 
drug drivers driving under the influence of drugs. Um, and they felt that sleep deprivation was as important um, an impairment as um, and to be equivalent to the 50 mg of alcohol per 100 mils of blood. Um, but studies have shown that if you take amphetamine, it doesn't um, repair that sleep deprivation. So quite an interesting background to amphetamine. Um, uh, we also established that them um, in small in small doses are used by the military to maintain concentration and wakefulness in its um, combat pilots. Um, and we looked at um, we looked at the literature and the information that we already had in our drivers. So drivers apprehended under the influence of um, amphetamine in the in the UK had a mean concentration of between well, nearly 500 and six. 100 micrograms per litre um, and so in in the absence of any information in the scientific literature about odd risks and concentration we looked at the levels that were identified within our own driving populations and considered um, where we would set the the level in relation to that and any levels found in, in people using therapeutically um, in terms of um, evidence for risk, so um, the risk, the odds ratios were actually higher for the risk of a road traffic collision um, following consumption than either cannabis or cocaine. Um, so again, meta-analysis, um, which is a sophisticated use of looking at lots of different studies, um, found the odds ratio was four um, times or more. The risk in one study, in um, an interesting study in um, amphetamine, uh, sorry, in methamphetamine, the risk again was even higher. And we think possibly that's because of the short acting um, nature of the drug, the fact that it takes effect um, quickly uh, and um, is deemed to be the stronger drug if you compare it to amphetamine. So odds ratios of around eight. So eight times the risk um, for um, methamphetamine compared to two for cannabis. Just a little bit about um, cocaine. So um, this was the drug that was used, um, and was most commonly used after cannabis in, in the UK, um, also the case in several European countries. So, and odds ratio suggests you're three times at risk of being seriously injured um, using cocaine. There's again the same discussion about um, whether cocaine be binging causes um, sleep deprivation, which is also um, a problem for driving. We also considered whether, because cocaine was a very fast acting drug, whether we should look at benzoylagonine, the main metabolite, um, and whether we discussed whether or not we should set a threshold for cocaine and benzoylagonine. Um, and also similar issues with the use of alcohol and cocaine both increased that odds ratio. <laughs> so odds ratios, various different studies, um, ranging from your meta-analysis of um, an odds ratio of about three um, to one that's slightly higher. So in the ballpark of between two and three times the, the odds. Um, there are hospital studies. So again, in this case, a study would look at all drivers hospitalized after a road traffic accident and identify how many of those were using um, cocaine and compare the odds of those drivers that had not used the drug to those that had. So uh, a little summary, um, a new offense of driving with a certain specified control drug um, in excess of a specified whole blood concentration came into force in March 2015. Um, again, this was an addition to the existing regulations on impaired driving and fitness to drive. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about this um, later, but it's a strict liability offence. So if you are over the concentration in blood, then um, you will be fined. You may lose your licence and there may be a prison sentence. So in terms of levels, um, the risk-based approach taken by the panel um, is there to see, and you can see the concentrations that we considered, and these were very much in relation to 
the risk of having a road traffic accident. And then um, following discussion with the government, and this went um, right to um, number 10, to the Prime Minister, David Cameron. And I, I think the issue here was that there was an issue, I guess, about condoning illicit drug use. If we have a group of illicit substances, why are we allowing them to be used um, to drive. So this was the argument, the discussion that um, the government had. So in the end, for the illicit substances, the um, number 10, the government, the Department for Transport, decided to go for, rather than a risk-based approach, a low level of detection level. And um, again, we met as a panel um, and discussed what this might be and the values are there on there. So in the end, despite having a risk-based approach, um, the government um, went for a low-level approach, and those are the values that are currently in our legislation. Um, so I'm going to move on now to other approaches and just talk a little bit about medicinal substances, um, and, and then <coughs> we, can, we can discuss these. So... Um, Zero tolerance approach or um, within the UK, it was preferred to be called a lower limit of detection. So this, I guess, equates to a complete ban. So if you're found with this substance in your body above the low levels identified, then that is um, you are arrested, you are guilty. Um, the other approach that's often used is, is what's called the per se approach. It's based on the detection of the drug above a well-defined limit, so um, as of um, our risk-based approach. And as you have seen, it, it relates more likely to risk um, and to driver safety than a zero to tolerance approach. Um, and you can have different types of per se. So you can have a pharmacological effect approach, which some jurisdictions have um, and taken this approach. So I think the Dutch and possibly the Norwegians have taken this approach with amphetamines, and they've said um, they've set a level at 50 microliters, micrograms per liter for amphetamines, and have included in that any amphetamine type drug, um, and that is based on what they perceive to be a, a, a pharmacological effect threshold. Whereas others will use a laboratory-based cutoff or um, the odds ratio approach that we took. Um, so we looked at controlled drugs within the panel, and there is a specific definition for a controlled drug in the UK, uh, which I won't reflect on for too long. Um, and the two drugs or two groups of drugs that we considered in the legislation were the benzodiazepines, um, the anxiolytics and the sedatives. Um, quite simply, benzodiazepines are used more in the UK than in Europe by the driving population. In Europe, it was found that um, women aged 35 and above and who were daytime drivers were the people that tended um, to be involved in road traffic incidents. And um, again, the European study, the Druids um, studies, identified uh, the use of benzodiazepines to be between two and five times the risk in terms of um, road traffic accidents compared to no use. We also found in the literature that the first two to four weeks of a prescription of anxiolytics um, tend to increase the risk, so you're more likely to um, have a road traffic accident um, when you start a new prescription, which is, which I guess is sensible if we think about it. These drugs um, um, do bring about sedation, they reduce anxiety, they they um, slow down in some cases our responses and our reactions. Um, and again, looking at alcohol, benzodiazepines and alcohol, um, alcohol alone um, be between the ranges of 0.2 and 0.8 were looked at. So um, odds ratio of, ben of, of alcohol is about two, odds ratio of alcohol um, plus benzodiazepines was about seven. So again, I think throughout our work, the incorporation of alcohol with other psychoactive drugs was, was significantly important in terms of driver safety. Um, 
looking at the Druid studies a little bit more so, Druid among killed drivers, benzodiazepines was the second most frequent toxicological finding. Um, determined that it, they had definitely have a, a, um, a poor effect on driving behavior in the older patient. Again, this was um, a difficult conversation that we um, had with um, the government. Uh, it, again, we didn't want to frighten the older population and um, worry them about driving. We didn't want them to stop taking medication when they really um, needed to benefit it. But at the same time, we also felt that there should be some education about the use of benzodiazepines and alcohol, about driving when you've just started um, a new prescription etc and some of these findings were quite significant so in road traffic um, collisions victims aged 60 and above um, benzos were associated with a significantly higher crash risk so the odds ratio um, was about five and, and older patients were between four to six were more likely to be hospitalized following a road traffic accident um, in others in the same age group who were not prescribed benzos so there, there's a lot of information out there about benzodiazepine and drivers, particularly in older populations, and that this doesn't um, bode well for driver safety. It was quite a tricky discussion to have with um, the government in terms of how we were going to get that out without worrying our, our older population who um, need these drugs. So some specific... Um, Odds ratios. Um, interestingly, zopiclone, um, uh, one of the Z drugs, um, isn't included in our legislation because it's not a cohort. It's, it wasn't at the time a controlled drug, but um, we certainly looked and found that the risk of driving with zopiclone in your system was um, in the same ballpark as the other benzodiazepines. Um, and a study in, in the UK found that any benzodiazepine with a positive breath test um, was deleterious to driving, so an odds ratio again of about eight. Um, we also looked at um, opioids, and interestingly, the data is quite tricky to look at here because um, it's certainly the research literature tends to group together morphine, methadone, dimorphine, um, and they describe, the literature describes either opiates, which has um, morphine, dimorphine, codeine, and opiates, which has morphine, methadone, and dimorphine. So there's some overlap in both groups, um, and accordingly, there seems to be um, a range of risk according to which drug you've, you've taken. Um, medicinal opioids, interestingly, seem to have a higher risk um, odds ratio than illicit use. Um, it may be that illicit opioids, um, uh, people don't drive. So we also looked at um, addict populations and looked at the light, whether or not they were driving populations. And certainly our more severely dependent opioid users, our heroin addicts, our, those that are prescribed methadone, don't, certainly in the UK, in the cities that we looked at, don't seem to drive as regularly as people who are prescribed medicinal opioids. And the same kind of discussion. Um, we didn't want um, the general population to feel that it was too dangerous to drive um, on a medicine that they were taking for pain relief. Um, we contacted pharmaceutical companies, or rather they were very interested and contacted us because they felt that people often drove better if they were not in pain um, than if they were on a pain medication. So again, difficult conversations um, about how we dealt with this. Uh, a little bit more, as I've said, there is a range in terms of the literature, in terms of odd ratios. I suspect depending on the drugs and possibly depending on um, the country. So the European countries um, mentioned here weren't necessarily the four same European countries. Um, a little bit about methadone. Uh, again, the literature is very interesting at lower concentrations of methadone in blood. Um, drivers were able to pass their 
their driving test um, they were able to drive um, safely it was only at higher concentrations that the reaction time decision time decreases so we actually set a threshold that was fairly high um, looking at people that were on doses of 60 mix and above and of course we also um, looked at the fact that um, met those in treatment on methadone aren't always drug free so we we felt confident that um, that this was a sensible way to go in in terms of our driving population so legislation for the panel so the expert panel um, set concentrations that took into consideration what we found in drivers um, that was published in the literature, what we found in um, concentrations apprehended in the UK, as well as information about the drug concentrations that you would expect to see in a therapeutic uh, patient who was therapeutically um, satisfied if you like it in terms of a steady state concentration so you can see that the concentrations are are higher than the levels for um, our illicit substances uh, and um, in the legislation the government accepted our approach so a threshold approach was um, acknowledged as the way forward for um, what we've deemed to be the medicinal compounds and you'll see the only one that is um, different is the amphetamine where the panel felt um, that it, uh, we set a level that was too high and so after a second consultation um, and talking to the panel we, we reduced that to 250. So the way the legislation is set is that we have therapeutic levels based on risk for our medicinal compounds and lower levels based on um, a zero tolerance approach for our um, illicit substances. Um, this is a little bit about the medical defense. So you are, as I mentioned, um, able to produce this if you're taking a drug within the legislation uh, legitimately. Um, and the advice that we give to um, people, and this has gone out to pharmacies and to GPs and to health centres, is that you should carry something with you as a driver to demonstrate um, that this is the case. So um, here, advice deemed helpful for patients to keep something suitable with them. Um, nearly there. So a little bit of information about alcohol and drug use. So as we've mentioned, significant um, impact on driver safety. Um, one study um, from Druid identified that the risk of using um, drugs, plural and alcohol, um, increases your road traffic risk by about 30 times. So alcohol use and drugs, not a good combination for road safety at all. Um, a little bit more, so uh, multiple drug use, um, this is multiple drugs without alcohol, uh, again, um, compared to no drug use, the alteration is about six. And then multiple drugs, and this is Movig in 2004, if people want to go and have a look at the study, um, identified, you know, a hundred times the risk if somebody was using drugs and alcohol. So a range of different findings in the literature, but they all point in the same direction, I think, that alcohol use um, at any level, it seems. So even if you're drinking be below the legal limit and you take drugs and you drive, then this is not good for driver safety. Um, and in fact, I will say we recommended to the government that they really should try and tackle this. And um, we felt that there should be a lower level set for alcohol use um, that could be brought into um, consideration if drugs were found to be positive in a driver. Um, and they, they felt it was too difficult to introduce at the time of introducing new drug drive legislation. So it's on the back burner for the moment. Um, so um, I think this is what happens. So um, police will stop somebody for a driving test they tend to be breathalyzed first. So there is a worry that sometimes drug use will not be um, picked up even though it's there. 
So um, they may drug screen if the breathalyzer is not positive. We're currently using oral fluid um, and we test at the roadside for cannabis and cocaine. And I should say BZE at the moment. And then if that is positive or they're impaired, they go off to the police station and have a blood test where we will test for all 17 drugs. Um, at present, blood is the only matrix that we can use for evidential testing. Um, there is a current panel which I'm chairing looking at other um, matrices, particularly oral fluid, to see if we, there is enough information in the literature, scientific evidence to use oral fluid as a confirmatory ma matrix. Um, we don't think there is quite at the moment. Um, issues for blood sampling. If the blood sample is taken at the roadside, then um, it has to be sent to the laboratory really quite quickly. Um, obviously, you need chain of custody and our labs have to be accredited. Drink drive penalties. I thought I'd just bring this in um, as a comparison to our drug drive. So being in charge of a, a vehicle, whilst above the legal limit through drink, you get three months imprisonment or two, five, fine, a possible ban. And then it escalates um, up to causing death by careless driving uh, and, and very serious um, bans. We do have a high risk um, drink driver scheme where people, if they have um, been banned three times or if they've um, refused a sample or if they've a very high concentration go on to a high risk driver scheme and they have to be medically tested to be given their license back we don't have that at the moment for um, drug driving although there this is certainly being considered and and it's being worked out how that might operate so at the moment, if you're convicted of drug, dr drug driving, you'll get a minimum of a one-year driving ban, unlimited fine, so it goes up to £5,000 actually, um, six months in prison, criminal record, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I've put this at the end, although I'm not necessarily going to talk about it. So, um, there is growing evidence for cannabis. It's part of our legislation. Um, and there is information about MDMA, although I know this isn't um, a drug that's, that uh, is at the top of your list. So finally, acknowledgements of my expert panel. Um, we're all currently working on the alternative matrices, as mentioned. Um, and there's a reference, but I know you've seen the report. So thank you very much. That's me. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Wolf. That was very detailed and very thorough, and I think people have found that very interesting. We do have space for questions. You can either come to this microphone, or we have a ro roving microphone, and Dr. Wolf will be able to hear you from the other end. Have I can even questions? see you. Oh, yes. There's a mic. There's a camera over there. David Caldicott. Uh, thank yeah. you, Professor. Oh, yeah. Use the microphone. That's how she can hear you. I would have think that they'd probably hear me anyway. <laughs> Without the internet even. Thank you, Prof. Um, huge fun, brilliant. Um, loved your paper from 2001 on pill testing, by the way. Um, oh, thank you. The, the, um, the question that I have and you, you, uh, that you alluded to um, was, do you have any figures for the odds ratio for MDMA at all? As far um, as... Not as far as I remember, not separately, because they're, they're, the research tends to include all the amphetamines together. So um, I can have a look and let you know, but I, I think it, the Druid research, for instance, included MDMA in the class of amphetamines. So it's quite difficult to tease out individual drugs, which is what we needed to do for our legislation. So, I just noticed that on the illicit drug table that you showed, the disparity yes. between the, uh, the level that you gave um, and the recommended low level from the uh, legislators was probably at its greatest for MDMA. Um, did that suggest that the expert committee didn't really feel that it was a, a major problem? Um, no, I, I think it was 
it was in relation to the, it was just a, a, the committee that set the 10 micrograms per litre was looking at what could be easily, um, the lowest level at which it could be easily quantified. So it, it uh, and we set a level that we thought was at risk. So um, the, the, the gap or the difference between the 10 and the 300 is just as it was, I think. It was the, once we decided that it, it was going to be um, a zero tolerance approach, it was looking at a level that the forensic laboratories could easily measure. So that was why it was set to, at the level that it was. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Wolf. Um, my question is about uh, Kakam's at some points you made towards the end about the penalties and okay. the and the disparity, the the difference between the penalties for alcohol offences and the drug offences, and taking into account what you've told us about the high odds ratios for um, for alcohol in terms of road crash risk. Uh, compared with a lot of the other, uh, the, the currently illegal drugs um, alone. Um, so I'm, it, it seems to be, uh, on the face of it, quite an inconsistent approach that the government has taken, harsher penalties for the lesser offence, in a sense, harsher penalties for the less, lesser risk. Um, I'm wondering uh, just if you could say something about how that came about and what response there may have been from the public at large and from the um, communities and organisations of people who use drugs, if you know anything about that aspect as well. Okay, um, so the general public were very, in, were in favour. There was, um, I think that you could generally say they were very positive about having drug drive legislation. The, the whole thing set off in the UK because um, a young the young girl was killed um, when a driver mounted a pavement and was later found to be high on cannabis. Um, and it started off by a local petition. The MP took it to the government and it, it piqued the interest of the Prime Minister. So this legislation um, had great popular backing. And it went through very, very quickly. If you see, we um, sort of, it started in 2011 and by 2015, there was a drug law in place. That's that's really quite quick in terms of um, the way things usually happen it, in the government. So it, it's, it was very popular. So the issue about penalties wasn't a problem in the general population because um, I think people felt that those that were driving were not being picked up and identified and were a danger on the roads. Um, in terms of drug users, we sent the report to um, some very well-known drug charities. So there's a charity called Release. Um, and I have to say, I was surprised that they, they were also very positive in terms of um, the evidence that we provided and that dr driver, driver safety should involve um, some legislation um, about the removal of people who use drugs. So there was a much more positive response, I guess, to um, the legislation than, than I thought there might be in some areas. Uh, we were petitioned by um, a couple of pharmaceutical companies who were very worried about the, the use of the therapeutic drugs. Um, there was very little uptake or very little popular, uh, a very small popular movement, if at all, by drug using communities, even the cannabis using community, um, strangely. And um, at the time that we released the report, I was looking at um, various different um, websites and users for us for cannabis. and. It was discussed in great detail, interestingly, and a, an awful lot of the users were agreeing that people who smoked cannabis, for instance, should not be driving when they were high. Um, so a much, I guess a much more positive impact across the piece than, than perhaps um, you may feel. Certainly I, I thought that we get. And um, 
the penalties seem to have just gone into legislation. Um, it wasn't something the panel got involved with. It was very much um, the Home Office. So in the UK, the Home Office and the Department for Transport um, work together on these things. So Department for Transport is driver safety, Home Office is illicit drugs, etc. So um, there wasn't a big pushback in terms of the penalties or that the fact that we'd introduce this legislation. We have just time for one more quick question. Bill Bush. Thank you. I'm wondering if the panel had before it any information about the increase or otherwise of road safety in jurisdictions where drug testing had was in, in, in place. Um, what kind of drug testing did you mean? Well, um, such as the sort of testing that uh, you, you mentioned in your in, in, in your address with the with the saliva test and uh, um, uh, with potentially with um, no uh, uh, no threshold. So, just repeat the question for me. Sorry, I, I'm just so wondering: did did the panel have before it any evidence? Uh, from jurisdictions where roadside drug testing occurred about impact on actual road safety in those jurisdictions? Um, there isn't an awful lot of literature about that. Well, I think we did look, um, the Norwegians have done and, and continue to produce a, a lot of research in drug driving um, and possibly um, who else would be there? So there are some European countries that look at this. I think, as you may suspect, what we're finding is that there is a the general public tends to improve its behaviour, but certainly coming out of the research in Norway, what tends to be left are um, drug users, actually, people who misuse substances regularly, who continue this behaviour, and who don't seem to pay too much attention to new to this legislation. So we're, I, th I think what we'll find is the people that persist in, in committing offences are um, an entrenched population of drug users, which is much the same as we find in our drink population. So the high-risk drink drivers tend to be repeat offenders, tend to be people who continue to drink in a, a dangerous way so um yes general population pays attention generally um those that use drugs on a regular basis and misuse them tend not to does that help yes thank you that's consistent with some evidence we had earlier in the afternoon so that um thank you that confirms that we will wrap it up there we're on time or a little behind but thank you very much dr wolf for joining us early in your morning and sharing your vast knowledge with us on this topic. Thank you very much. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll now take the afternoon tea break. We are a little behind schedule, but uh, we'll take about 15 minutes. So if we can resume at six o'clock and there's snacks and afternoon tea outside, and then we're going to be having a dinner break at a bit seven o'clock or so, so just manage your, you know, how many how many cakes you have.